So again, it's, it's great to be here today and uh, to have all of you here uh, for, uh, for this session. Um, this morning, my real purpose is to provide a brief overview of the organizations of the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and the Joint Fun Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. I'm going to do that first, then provide you a synopsis of how we contribute to the Army and the Joint Force Space and Missile Defense Enterprises. I will then uh, discuss how our capabilities integrate with the multi-domain environment. And lastly, I will highlight emerging technologies that support our forces where industry and academia can assist the warfighter. But first, as uh, General Carter Ham was talking about, uh, let me discuss a little bit of our potential adversaries to kind of set the stage for her. Our potential adversaries have demonstrated a commitment to, the, to advance their missiles, unmanned aircraft systems, and long-range artillery and rocket capabilities. In the six years since assuming power, Kim Jong-un has launched more than 80 missiles. To put that in perspective, his father launched 16 during his 17 years in power, and his grandfather launched 15 missiles from the inception of the North Korean Ballistic Missile Defense Program in 1984 until his death in 1994. This year, Kim Jong-un has launched more than 14 ballistic missiles, and his aggressive ballistic missile testing program continues to advance. In 2016, North Korea successfully tested a solid-fueled submarine-launched ballistic missile. During this calendar year, North Korea launched a new solid fuel MRBM from a mobile launcher, and this is a first. In addition, they began testing a new IRBM in April and conducted a successful launch of the system in May. Finally, North Korea launched the country's first ICBM on July 4th. The National Air and Space Intelligence Center recently uh, stated, quote, North Korea is likely developing close range ballistic missiles with increased accuracy, range, and lethality. These findings do, in fact, support North Korea's commitment to their ballistic missile defense program. North Korea is not only, is not only the country developing ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. A recent report, again by the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, stated that China and Iran have also been developing new medium-range and intermediate-range ballistic missiles, of which many will be armed with non-conventional warheads. Our adversaries continue to test and develop their space and missile defense capabilities. So the potential of our adversaries to employ ballistic and cruise missiles as an asymmetric weapon of choice exerts their national aims and potentially holds the United States, our deployed forces, our allies and partners at risk. As threat capabilities evolve and capacity grows, air, space and missile defense modernization efforts and initiatives must continue in order to avoid adversary overmatch. The threats our warfighters face are real, the consequences are in fact grave. The challenges facing the United States, specifically U.S. space and missile defense systems, are present, future, and constantly evolving. That is why we, the United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and Joint Forces Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense are and must remain ready. So, dynamic is the word I would choose to describe this past year across the Army Space and Missile Defense Enterprise. We anticipate and foresee the future to be challenging due to an increasing number of potential adversaries and threats with the ability to attack land, air, maritime space, cyberspace assets, and challenging DOD's dominance and potentially the United States' ability to achieve military objectives. The United States Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and Joint Forces Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense are poised to deter, defend, and defeat if called upon to do so. Slide two, please. So as you can see by this slide, I, I work for a couple different people. At the top of the chart, I work for, on the left-hand side, General Milley as Chief of Staff of the Army, and then on the right there with the uh, STRATCOM symbol, General Hyten. The U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, and JFCCIMD are unique in the Army and the Joint Force with diverse and very specialized sets of missions and functions. As such, we are distinctively positioned to perform the functions of space and missile defense enterprise integration as designated by the Chief of Staff of the Army in, in 2014. 
The Army Air, Space, and Missile Defense Force is a key strategic enabler for the Army, the Joint Force, and our great nation. We are a multifaceted, multi-component organization safeguarding the nation and providing the Department of Defense and our allies access to vital space-based resources that are globally engaged and regionally aligned. As Commander of United States Army Space and Missile Defense Command, I have Title X responsibilities to man, organize, train, and equip space and global ballistic missile defense forces for the Army. I serve as the Army's force modernization proponent for space, global ballistic missile defense, and high altitude forces and capabilities development. As we know, there is no sanctuary on today's battlefield, no rear area, not even in space. We work tirelessly to ensure our vital space and missile defense capabilities are available, not just to fight, but to win. We enable the Army's use of space and we provide multi-component forces to defend 24-7, 365 against intercontinental ballistic missile threats. As the commander of Army Forces Strategic Command, I am the Army Service Component Commander to the United States Strategic Command. My team and I are responsible for planning, integrating, coordinating, and providing all Army space and missile defense forces and capabilities in support of U.S. STRATCOM missions, which include satellite communications and missile warning using our Joint Tactical Ground Station, or JTAGs, to support the combatant commands and joint warfighters. Furthermore, I serve as the senior commander for both Fort Greeley, Alaska, and U.S. Army Garrison Kwajalein. As the commander of the U.S. STRATCOM's JFCC IMD, my team and I are responsible for synchronizing missile defense planning, conducting ballistic missile defense operations support, recommending allocation of missile defense assets, and advocating for missile defense capabilities on behalf of the combatant commanders. As STRATCOM's executive agent for ballistic missile defense education and training, we provide training to over 3,000 students per year from across the DOD with our allies and partners. This education and training enables our joint forces to achieve U.S. military objectives while affording our allies and partner nations the opportunity to participate in Nimble Titan. The JFCC IMD leads the Nimble Titan multinational military defense campaign for experimentation. This is an unclassified two-year program focusing on regional and global strategic policy military challenges using a 10-year future epic and provides the only global forum for policymakers and military leaders to discuss strategic policy options to, that contribute to missile defense programs and procedures. The Nibble Titan Missile Defense Campaign for Experimentation continues to expand in scope, size, and influence. Due to an overwhelming desire of the 28 member nations and international organizations, Nibble Titan has officially expanded its focus from purely ballistic missile defense to integrated air and missile defense. From a U.S. perspective, it is clearly in our best interest to encourage international policy collaboration and military dialogue in order to optimize the placement of limited forces and potentially enable foreign partners to defend, to defend mutually important assets. In September 2018, NATO will host the Nibble Titan 18 Senior Leader Forum. This forum will be an opportunity to highlight the benefits Nimble Titan provides as a mean to addressing world challenges while building strong allied and partner nation relationships. And lastly, my team and I serve as the Army's Air and Missile Defense Enterprise Integrator with responsibilities to synchronize the balance execution of the Air and Missile Defense strategy across the functions of force planning and sourcing requirements, combat and material development, and acquisition and life cycle management. Slide, please. So I use this slide to highlight the fact that we truly are a global command. In short, SMDCR Strat, JFCC IMD, is deployed globally at 21 different locations with service members and civilians operating in 11 different time zones. Our organizations are uniquely organized to provide Army Service Component Command operational support, service 10 acti Title 10 activities, and Army proponency in order to provide, support, develop, and deliver critical forces and capabilities to the Army and the combatant commands. In addition, we are geographically well positioned in Huntsville, Alabama with the Army Material Command, NASA, Missile and Space Intelligence Center, Missile Defense Agency, the Program Executive Office for Missiles and Space. 
This provides a strong, strong technical base in the Tennessee Valley, as well as with the space and missile defense communities in Colorado Springs to include US NORTHCOM, Air Force Space Command, and JFCC IMD. So now that I've told you a little about uh, the organizations uh, within the command, let me transition to the space and miss how space and missile defense integrates into the multi-domain environment in the present and in the future. The Chief of Staff of the Army, the United States Army has directed the development of multi-domain task forces with the intent to integrate, integrate organic and joint counter-air, counter-fire, cyber, and space capabilities to ensure joint force freedom of action in future conflicts. Throughout world history, wars were fought across multi-domains, primarily on land, air, and at sea. In the last three decades, the operational environment continues to expand to include space, cyber, and the electromagnetic spectrum. Our adversaries have observed that we fight best as an integrated joint team fighting as a coalition force. Multi-domain battle describes an approach for military operations against a sophisticated peer threat that can test U.S. forces in all domains and challenge U.S. deterrence in the 2025 to 2040 timeframe. In multi-domain battle, U.S. forces converge capabilities to create temporary windows of dominant domain superiority to deter, counter, and defeat peer rivals on a complex battlefield. The Army operating concept, when in a complex world, describes how future Army forces will prevent conflict, shape security environments, and win wars while operating as part of a joint force and working with multiple allies and partner nations. The Army operating concept guides future force development by identifying first order capabilities that are flexible and resilient ground formations that project combat power in the land, air, maritime space, and cyberspace domains, along with the electromagnetic spectrum for the joint force to support U.S. policy objectives. It provides the intellectual foundation and framework for learning and applying what we observe for future force development for 2020 and beyond. The title, Win in a Complex World, emphasizes the importance of ready land forces for protecting our nation and securing our vital assets against determined, elusive, and increasingly capable adversaries, while the concept underscores the foundational capabilities the Army needs to prevent wars and shape security environments it also recognizes that to deter enemies, reassure allies, and influence neutrals, the Army must conduct sophisticated expeditionary maneuver and joint combined arms operations. To win in a complex world, Army forces must provide the joint force with multiple options, integrate the efforts of multiple partners, operate across multiple domains, and present our adversaries with multiple dilemmas. To create windows of advantage, the Army must maintain the ability to achieve tactical overmatch, defeat enemy forces and secure territory while developing new cross-domain capabilities to support and enable the joint force in all domains. The commander of the Training and Doctrine Command, General David Perkins, said, quote, Doctrine is how we run our Army today. Concepts are how we change the Army for the future. This concept intellectually changes how we think about solving problems, end of quote. The developing multi-domain task force capability is an innovative initiative that may change the Army and the joint force in the future and rest assured space and missile defense will be an integral component. Adversaries are attempting to limit U.S. freedom of maneuver in all domains and in areas previously uncontested by developing capabilities to fracture and exploit potential U.S. vulnerabilities. Credible forward presence and expeditionary maneuver that includes space-based capabilities and cyber electromagnetic uh, activities, integrated pre precision fires and layered air and missile defense, air defense create temporary windows of dominance allowing the joint forces to seize, retain, and exploit the advantage. Today, our adversaries' capabilities can contest U.S. forces from deployment to employment. The joint force cannot assume uncontested access to space, cyber, space, and electromagnetic spectrum capabilities critical for current command and control systems. Adversaries are developing capabilities to attack U.S. platform systems and networks in space, cyberspace, and the electromagnetic spectrum. Currently, the joint force needs to improve upon our ability to avert such attacks that will degrade reconnaissance, command and control, 
and PNT, or position navigation and timing, and disrupt force deployment activities and other logistics operations. Space capabilities and their integration into multi-domain battle represent a principal contribution the Army space can make towards setting the theater. In coordination with the Department of the Army and TRADOC, specifically ARCTIC, we are leading and participating in concept to capability development activities to identify innovative and creative solutions to address the multi-domain environment. The multi-domain task force is one of those initiatives. Designed to counter the multi-domain challenge exacerbated by an A2AD environment and enable cross-domain maneuver and fire, General Milley at the recent Future of the Warfare Conference described the multi-domain task force as, quote, a relatively small organization, 1,500 or so troops, capable of space, cyber, maritime, air, and ground warfare. Smaller, dispersed, very agile, very nimble organizations that are networked into lethal systems that deliver either air or maritime will be essential to destroy the A2AD network, end of quote. My organizations are looking to identify opportunities for the next leap ahead, game-changing technology or concept in support of providing dominant space missile defense capabilities to the war Army warfighters. The task force integrates space effects at the tactical level to support maneuver elements of the operational Army. The task force will lead to a growth of Army space forces and lead to a change in the way the Army currently employs space effects. Part of the task force concept considers several types of space effects to include na navigation warfare. The future demands for Army space capabilities, particularly satellite communications, will continue to grow. We want to ensure we want to ensure that is not a we want to make sure that we don't we don't have a fair fight with our adversaries, particularly in the space domain and missile defense. So in order to ensure we outpace our adversaries, SMDC, RSTRAT, JFCC, IMD will continue to coordinate with the services, the Department of the Defense, and our coalition partners to maintain, manage, and defend these critical operations. We will continue to develop technologies important to increasing our space capabilities and defending them against our adversaries while at the same time creating dilemmas for them by staying several steps ahead of them. The key to a strategic win is to present our adversaries with multiple dilemmas in order to influence their actions by holding something they value at risk. Army Space Forces allow joint force commanders to dictate the terms of operations and render enemies incapable of responding effectively. Joint force operations require the enemy to fight in multiple directions, expend fires and combat power at unsustainable rates. Cross-domain maneuver capabilities prevent threats from fracturing the joint force by domains and functions, allowing the joint force to detect, enlarge, and exploit windows of temporary advantage through the depth of the battlefield in a campaign of multi-domain battles. The Space and Missile Defense Enterprise will continue to research and develop emerging technologies in order to balance the threat calculus our forces face in the multi-domain battle. As the Space and Missile Defense Enterprise continues research and development of emerging technologies in the multi-domain environment, there are several initiatives that may advance our capabilities, address our critical shortfalls, and achieve cost-effective solutions. We will continue to leverage our partnerships with industry and academia to advance these initiatives. The Secretary of Defense's Innovative Initiative, or the Third Offset Strategy, calls for a new research and development approach to identify, develop, and field breakthrough technologies, as well as innovative ways to employ resources to achieve greater strategic effect. This strategy identifies the need for a more sustainable and cost-effective approach and a new strategy based on a preemptive strike with non-kinetic technologies, such as electromagnetic propagation, cyber, as well as kinetic options to defeat ballistic missile threats before they are ever launched. Slide, please. One example to highlight in this regard is directed energy, which remains a low cost and effective complement to kinetic energy options. And there is a lot of congressional and DOD interest in this specific area. SMDC RSTRAT participated in the maneuver fires integration experiment with the striker based mobile experimental high energy laser. This is a 5KW laser, and let's pull out my, on this chart, it is this platform right here. 
Our organizations also took place in the Joint Improvised Threat Defeat Organization's Hard Kill Challenge with both the Mobile Expeditionary High Energy Laser as well as our heavy expanded mobile tactical truck laser, which essentially is the 5KW laser is here, the 10KW laser is right here. Both of the laser systems were highly successful. One of the benefits of the 5KW is that it does not require engineers to operate, and therefore we were able to train our warfighters in preparations for these exercises in just two weeks. Slide, please. So this is Specialist Brandon Salloway, was the first uniformed service member to actually use the, uh, the mobile energy, uh, mobile expeditionary high energy laser to, to success, successfully engage a moving target. The side of the striker uh, displays an array of stickers that are uh, annotating each kill. He pointed to the one that represents his own kill in this picture, and Specialist Salloway remarked, quote, I'm really excited to be part of a historic event, really excited to see the Army working on the next generation of tools for us so that we can maintain our edge, the cutting edge, end of quote. So in FY18, we will continue to improve upon these cutting edge systems by testing a 50KW laser integrated into the similar platform. A 50KW laser is a key component in a system known as the High Energy Laser Tactical Vehicle Demonstrator. These advanced laser systems can be integrated into a more rugged and mobile platforms compatible with the Army's battle management network in order to provide a lethal, low cost, and persistent defensive capability. But, we aren't, but uh, some DCR strat is not working this alone. Or rather, we're working with industry and local universities. And we are pursuing creating a high energy center of excellence at Redstone Arsenal. With our partners on and around Redstone Arsenal, and across the nation and internationally, we are conducting basic and applied research that is laying the foundation for future weapon systems. Next slide. So for a moment, I'd like to talk about another technology we are developing. Crestral Eye is an electro-optical microsatellite being developed as a joint capability technology demonstration. With Crestral Eye, we will attempt to demonstrate the military utility of providing near real-time situational awareness directly to a brigade combat team. Crestral Eye enhances the situational awareness of the brigade combat team by providing satellite imagery without the need for CONUS-based relays. The Crestral Eye is due to launch from Cape Canaveral very soon as part of the International Space Station cargo resupply mission. Once aboard the International Space Station, the crew will deploy this small satellite into its orbit. Once deployed and a safe distance away from the International Space Station, the satellite will automatically power up and will be ready to receive signals. Following the successful deployment of Crestral Eye, we will, continue to, we will be able to measure the utility of this capability through a series of tactical exercises over the next few years. So in closing, the development of the multi-domain battle concept will inform future joint and service operating concepts to meet the requirements in the operational environment against the evolving threats and emerging technologies. These efforts provide a foundation for the development of future capabilities and force development. The Army's top modernization priority is air and missile defense capabilities as well as space capabilities that include assured positioning, navigation, and timing requirements. To advance the proven idea of combined arms, multi-domain battle requires forces from each service to possess cross-domain capabilities while retaining overmatch within their own domain. Our air, space, and missile defense capabilities are an integral part of the multi-domain battle. It is an imperative that we get the requirements and contributions correct for future capabilities and force development. Given the increasing global threat, leveraging joint and allied partner integration is essential. We must continue to emphasize and advance interoperability and integration through operations, exercises, foreign military sales, and other security cooperation opportunities. Finally, we must develop and field breakthrough technologies that advance space and missile defense capabilities, address critical shortfalls, and achieve cost-effective solutions. This is an area DOD, industry, and academia must continue to work closely to achieve synergy and optimal capabilities. So thank you for your time today, and uh, again, it was a pleasure being with you. Thank you.
Sure. A question over here, sir. Good morning, sir. Courtney McBride from Inside the Army. A uh, couple of questions, actually. If you could uh, elaborate for us a little bit on the space and missile defense components of the uh, multi-domain task forces, what um, perhaps existing technologies uh, are available now that, that you might field to that, um, and also what's under development. Um, and then additionally, uh, what efforts you're you're undertaking on Assured PNT, whether there's uh, collaboration with the Rapid Capabilities Office on that effort. So for your, your first question on the, uh, so we're just, we're just now looking at that in terms of, uh, of uh, what the multi-domain, what our part of the multi-domain task force would be in terms of capabilities that we provide to it. But uh, in general today, you know, what we provide is we provide satellite communication support. We also provide missile warning and so as that task force comes together and gets further developed, you know, we will see, you know, exactly what the requirements will be. So what we'll do is we'll wait till the task force, they decide what the requirements are that we need to be able to support, and then we'll provide that accordingly. But in terms of technology right now, you know, uh, the technology that we're currently using will, will fit for the near term, and then we'll look to the long term for advancements and capability. Not the question. What was the question on? Sure. We're collaborating right now with the RCO on that. All right. Hi, General. Uh, Sydney Friedberg from Breaking Defense. To uh, ask about the freaking laser beams, which is uh, one of my favorite topics. Uh, you say you're moving you've, from the five and 10 kilowatt weapons <clears throat> that have been tested this year on uh, live fire tested, not just shot in, into, in, into the darkness. Uh, and you're moving to a 50 kilowatt weapon next year. Uh, if you go in more detail about that next step and you know, what kind of platform that's going to be, what kind of targets you're envisioning for a 50 kilowatt weapon, probably not boost phase intercept yet, but perhaps more than just drones, uh, and then what the path is beyond 50 kilowatts uh, as you evolve the capability. So thanks for that question. So it, as we kind of, as we, continue to grow the technology, you know, we take, you take bites at a time, if you will. So we've done 5KW successfully, 10KW. So the next in, next in line is the 50KW, where it'll obviously have a little more range, a little more power, a uh, little better beam control as we, as we move in the advancement. Our objective is to be out to 100KW uh, out in the 2022 timeframe. So each of these is what we call a kind of a, uh, uh, technology advancement stepping or sequencing to get to our objective, which is 100 kW. But with the 50 kW, you actually you're improving improving range, you're improving lethality, uh, and then again uh, improving the beam steering, if you will, to, to be more effective. Certainly. Certainly. <laughs> so you can you can imagine as you go from counter UAS capabilities, you know, small quadcopters, you increase uh, uh, power, if you will, with the uh, with the weapon system. It allows you to engage maybe different or larger types of targets. So potentially, rotor wing, fixed wing, those types of targets. One more, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dan Wasserby with Jane's. <clears throat> you mentioned for missile defense, some of your bigger challenges are China, Iran, North Korea, uh, all, all known to dabble in cyber attacks. So I, I recognize you can't get into the, the specifics of how you would defend your networks, but could you sort of I don't know, classify the threat for us? Just how much does that worry you? Does that keep you up at night? Is it something that's totally fine and we're all good? Or w w how much does it worry you? Well, so it doesn't keep me up at night. <laughs> I won't use the SecDevs quote, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't keep me up at night. But I will tell you, it's a, it's it's a, uh, it's a consideration that we need to take very seriously in everything that we that we do within the uh, missile defense enterprise. So you can imagine, as you have all of these automate, you know, we we have the very sophisticated automation capabilities within air and missile defense. You know, we need to make sure that we're protecting that and that we build that in. As we build, the, as we design the systems, and not 
not necessarily as we get to the tail end of that. And so, you know, the programs of record that we're working on right now have it built in from the very beginning, and it matures through the entire acquisition life cycle till you actually get the uh, weapon system or capability fielded. But it's something, you know, that's changing every day. I think we can all agree on that, that you know, it's becoming, you know, more aggressive, more uh, better fidelity in terms of being maybe to get into some of our our capabilities. So we just have to make sure that we train for that, we plan for that, and that our soldiers understand that. And we do a lot of that through uh, the space piece of my command in terms of providing space training out at uh, CTCs, as well as uh, along with our missile defense forces, providing a degraded op uh, environment where they understand what that could be. Okay. Uh, just one quick one, sir. Recently, the Secretary of Defense commented on the House appropriation to uh, stand up a, a space service branch. Do you, uh, do you envision such a thing in the near future, medium future? I, so for, you're alluding to the Space Corps? Yeah. yeah. We get, are we going to have Star Trek? I, I don't know. You know, I think you've probably seen kind of the, the uh, positions within the Air Force on that particular matter, you know, in, in where, where I'm responsible for it uh, in terms of Army space, Title X uh, responsibilities that I have, the, I'm very comfortable where the Army is right now with this. Uh, we have a very, um, I wouldn't say rapid acquisition, but we have a very uh, efficient acquisition process for Army space. And uh, I think we get to that because it is small, obviously, but it presides within one particular command, which is my command, working with some PEOs, uh, uh, PEOs that are outside of the command, but we have a fairly flat acquisition process. Thank you very much, sir. How about a hand for General Dickinson? <laughs>